long time I'm working on the victims from Vesuvius eruption, which is not only the 79 AD eruption, but also an old Bronze Age eruption, so-called the Avellino eruption, as we will see. And uh, even if, of course, the 79 AD eruption is the most famous one, due to the fact that towns like Herculaneum, Pompeii, Stabia, uh, were totally devastated and buried by this, this eruption. Uh, this is a Plinian eruption due to uh, the historical description from Pliny, Plinius the Younger. And uh, so we know that actually uh, a very large area around Vesuvius was, Vesuvius was totally uh, buried by this uh, debris, the volcanic debris. Uh, the eruption uh, probably, we are not sure, but probably due to uh, the, the geological and uh, geoarchaeological evidence starts around 12 antimeridian. So, AM. And uh, after about 12 hours, there is the collapse of the Plinian column, this one, which at the beginning of the eruption is, uh, is going to reach some, something like 30, 35 kilometers up in the stratosphere. But at a certain time, all this uh, lot of uh, cubic kilometers of ash, lapil, and so on, are going to collapse. So you have the collapse of the Plinian column, and so in, in by this way starts the uh, pyroclastic currents, surges and flow. So at the very beginning of the eruption, at this phase, due to the dominant winds, in that only one time for, for the 79 eruption, the dominant wind was in the southeast direction, so Pompeii. So uh, in this initial phase, you have uh, the collapse of the roofs. And so the people uh, just uh, sheltering within buildings that are going to die due to the crush of, of the structures. So only dead ones, they can die due to suffocation. But as we we'll see later, the most of the population around Vesuvius, Ercolano, Pompeii, Stad, and so on, they will all die very suddenly. So there is no time to breathe, no time to, to understand what is going on. And this was a, a new, in 2001 we published this on nature, because for, for many years archaeologists said, okay, the people died, they just suffocation, they were suffering. No, it was not true. Uh, so we see uh, how it's possible to uh, demonstrate this. Uh, so after several hours, we have the collapse and everything is going to be buried. So actually, this, uh, this kind of evidence is very important because uh, normally when you talk about uh, uh, archaeological sites, you find walls like this, there's almost nothing. The, the best uh, data often we have from the excavation graves, because inside graves you find objects, so uh, daily objects often or uh, offers to, to, to the death. Uh, and um, by this way, actually, at the same time, you have uh, a total devastation, but everything is very well preserved. So in, in the case of Ercolano and Pompeii, you have been, I hope for you, you have visited <laughs> at least Pompeii, but better Ercolano. And uh, so you see a complete town, so with buildings uh, until the third floor, uh, stairs, doors, uh, windows, uh, personal objects, people, animals, food, everything. Uh, so the discovery of uh, the first discovery is in the 18th century. Uh, the theater is the first to be discovered uh, of Herculaneum. And later, through the uh, um, excavation of Bourbons, uh, Herculaneum, the town of Herculaneum is, is, is found, and, and then Pompeii. Some, some time later. So uh, I had in the in the nine in the 90s, from 97 until 99, I had the opportunity to excavate on the ancient beach of Erquinana. This is a, is a, of course a, a recent image 
of, our, of the excavation of Hercule Island, but I cleaned a little bit to show you the, oh, sorry, to show you the beach and these 12 chambers, so-called boat chambers, uh, for the use uh, uh, of, of these rooms, and they're just facing the sea. So you see, this is the town, and this is the, the lower part of the town. And uh, here, within these 12 boat chambers and on the beach, were found something like 350 victims, scattered, of course. Also, uh, there was also a, a, a horse somewhere and a boat here somewhere else. And a soldier, which is a very important one. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have it because someone else has took away <laughs> and stays somewhere. Okay. Uh, the town actually was evacuated because during uh, the 19th century excavation, 20th century excavation, altogether we found something like a 35, 40 skeletons. So actually, uh, at the very beginning of the eruption, due to the direction of the, uh, the fallout in southeast direction, very probably, answer for sure, uh, a lot of people evacuated in the northwest direction through Naples and Putelli. And in fact, um, recently were found some uh, stone inscriptions uh, telling about families coming from Herculano and Pompeii. So a lot of people could evacuate. So we don't know why these 300, 400 people, the optimists, I don't know what, but they stayed here. So they, they didn't uh, run away. And uh, as the DNA, the, the first analysis about DNA from these people tell us that uh, they were just family groups, very, very, a uh, lot of family groups. Here, it's myself very young, when I was working, uh, oh, there was uh, this kind of evidence. When I start to work here, uh, it, I worked on these uh, rooms, um, the skeletons were already out. Just they excavated these rooms, because you must imagine that uh, Herculano was just covered by 25 meter thick deposit of ash. Uh, and once they reached the, the, the beach, with the excavation, of course, in the 80s, beginning of the 80s, they found the first victims on the beach and then later within the chamber. So they just excavated the chambers, taking off all the stuff, and then they stopped on skeletons. But a lot of archaeologists, anthropologists, they came you know, and they took the skull and said, oh, it's very good, the skull with the carries, and they put somewhere else. And then someone else come and take a long bow and make a radiograph. So when I came here, it was just a mess of bones, a situation like this. So I had to make a, a, a contrary of an excavation, to put back the bones first, like so. This is the situation before, after. This person is this one, this one is this one. So you see here, it's impossible to make anything, any documentation or uh, other work. And uh, so I prepared this uh, pallet surface like this. And then later, uh, a group of technicians, they came, they made the silicon rubber negative cast. And from the negative, then we, they obtained the positive. And now, if you go to visit Herculano, you find something like this, because at that time, I was a freelance archaeologist, bioarchaeologist, and they told me, okay, you remove the skeleton. I said, you are mad, because otherwise, <laughs> already the first part of the half part of the victims, they were removed in the 80s with a National Geographic project. So that was terrible. And, uh, and I said, no, no, we have to do just the contrary. So we put back the bones. We make plasticas, documentation before, during, after, and now you go and you will see, of course, the, the original situation. And, ah, possiamo partire questo. This is just this, the, the 3D reconstruction of this chamber, which is quite interesting because you can see in details the postures and the position. For instance, you see this is female. Within the pelvis was found the bones of a seven-month intrauterine fetus. 
uh, and it's this one. This is just a family group because this is a mother with a child in the pelvis, and this is a child on, on the left, on the right arm, and here's another child, and this is a male, and here there is another small child, so just a, a family group. Here you see actually what uh, was the direction, also oh, Vesuvius is here somewhere, this is a section of the town, so upper part of the town, then the lower, and then here there are the chambers with the people inside and the beach. So the first pyroclastic surge, the, the so-called surge killer, is the one that is going to pass very fast through the, the town, and then is going to stop uh, in mass on the beach and within the chambers. But in this case, without any mechanical impact. Uh, this is the, 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 the planimetry of uh, one of these chambers. And you see, this is the, the situation that I found when I was uh, without these ones, because the one, these ones they were removed on the beach. So I found a situation like this. So you see that the chambers are just, were just very full of people, 20 years, 25, 35, 45, and so on. So you must imagine that to work in such a situation of a mass of bones, it's not so easy. It was uh, quite difficult. Uh, but uh, it was possible and in different ways we organized to, to, to recognize each individual because that was the problem, to recognize each individual to make a good documentation before to remove, after mm, made the preparation for the cast. And here there's a section of the room. You see, here are the skeletons of the victims just on the floor, on the bottom. This is the sand of the beach that goes inside. And then there is the first, the first uh, uh, deposit, the deposit of the first pyroclastic surge, second surge, third surge, and so on. So what's important to, to, that we can see from, from this situation, that actually this, this situation is very important for volcanic risk because testifies that actually, even if the people was sheltered within closed structures, they were saved through the mechanical impact, but they died instantly due to the very high temperature of the surge. At this distance, we, it, it means uh, five, six kilometers away from the zoos. Here again, it's a phase of work to put back the bones. And uh, here you see that actually uh, this is the sand bottom, this is the sarge deposit, and this is the part of the skeleton laying within the ash deposit. And you see that uh, this is the sand, that actually uh, the, the, the skeletons were just floating within the ash deposit. They were not on the floor, the sand bottom floor. They just were floating within the, the, the ash deposit. Because when the, uh, the pyroclastic surge arrives within the chambers, it's very fast moving ash cloud, uh, very hot and uh, very rich in, in, in ash and gas. But due to the rapid disappearing of the flesh of the, the water of the body. Each body is a water, actually. The, the, the large part of the body is water. Uh, then all this mass of water, a kind of vaporization, vaporization, is going to, uh, to make, fluidify the, the, the ash deposit, which is going to iron. So they are just uh, uh, floating within this deposit. And also from here we see something very interesting, which this is, was very interesting to, uh, to understand how these people died, because okay, they died due to the eruption, okay, but how? Oh, the problem is that in this case, differently from other situations, you can see, I don't know, if you can, you can imagine the corpses of these people, as I, I did, as I, as I do, uh, but each individual was just frozen, frozen, it, but frozen in the last instant of life. So you don't see any conscious reaction. 
Later, we will see the two victims found uh, in Nola due to the Avellino erup Old Bronze Age eruption. In that case, as you will see, both the individuals were laying on one side with both hands in the face to try to, to do the last breathe. So in that case, they died due to suffocation. But here, the, the vital stance of these people, lifelike stance, we call, shows that the people didn't have the time to die by suffocation. They died instantly, and we will see later how, what's the mechanism of death. Another very important thing is that the difference, the big, biggest difference, the most clear evidence between Herculano, the Herculanum victims, and the Pompeii victims is that in Herculanum we have just skeletons and the ash is on the bones. The bones are just within the ash. But in Pompeii, you have casts, plaster casts. Right, the difference is that, and we demonstrated, that all over Vesuvius, around Vesuvius, five kilometers, six kilometers of Herculanum, seven kilometers of Plantis, 10, 12 kilometers of Pompeii, probably 20 kilometers away, Stabie, everyone dies due to, everyone dies instantly. Only at the very beginning, you have some people die due to the crash of buildings or for suffocation. But uh, in the, after the fallout phase, with the paroclastic surge phase, everyone dies instantly. In Pompeii, the temperature is lower because more close you are to the volcano, higher is the temperature. More you are far from the volcano and lower is the temperature. So also this through experimentation, we could detect the temperature to which the skeleton, not the body, the skeleton was exposed to. So slowly we will arrive to this. But what is very interesting here is that if I have skeletons in this condition or, wait, situation like this, you see? Look here. Although it's impossible to find a skeleton of a human body, like also animal body, like this from a grave. Although if you if you excavate a grave, I made often <laughs> from different times, not recent, and uh, then you have a hole in the ground, you put the body, you cover with the ground, and then 10, 20, 30 years, slowly, the ground is going to uh, substitute, uh, no, uh, replace, it's going to replace the flesh of the body. So that means that you will find always the body with bones moved. The skull is going to fall, the mandible the same. The femurs and the pelvis are going to open, but here you see that each single, even the smallest bone, even from the child, are just in their original anatomical connection. So this is the only evidence that can explain this, is that the flesh of this body was replaced very fast from the ash. And the demonstration is that the ash, once it reached the bones, is going to let the skull to explode to fracture long bones and uh, to let the hands and feet to contract. So, and these are all evidence of a very rapid, uh, uh, very rapid process. So it means that the thermal energy was so high to be enough to let the soft tissues to rapidly disappear, which is not in Pompeii, because in Pompeii, the 300 degree of temperature about, it's enough to kill them instantly, but not to let the soft tissue to disappear. So the body stays intact, the ash is going to harden around the body. It makes actually just uh, as we did here, a cast around the body. Then slowly the tissues are going to disappear. Fiorelli, very clear, clever, uh, found these holes in the ground, put the plaster in, and then you obtained the, uh, the plaster casts. So, as we said, there is no evidence of, uh, of, uh, of uh, just a voluntary reaction. So, the, the death is just uh, uh, in a time shorter than the conscious reaction time. So if you drive a car, for instance, 
and you see a dog or a child that runs in front of you, you will not think, okay, now I break, otherwise I cannot, you kill him. You must break in one tenth of a second to have a reaction. So here it's a 100 second to, 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 to let these people to stop. So it's a, it's a kind of way like living, dead. And we see this also through this uh, kind of uh, uh, vital posture. You see this one is just sitting with the head and the heart. I imagine the, the real person. I don't know if you can do this, but for me, it's, it's, uh, it's very clear this, after the work of cleaning of that mess of bones. And, and in fact, the best uh, preserved skeletons were the ones uh, in the lower level, because there were different levels of, of bodies, and these are just on the floor. And you see that uh, one also interesting evidence was, uh, and this testified that the, actually that uh, the collapse of the pinion column uh, occurred around midnight. All children are just laying on the bottom, they were just sleeping, for sure, at that time. Another uh, important evidence is that, okay, so due to the very high temperature of the surge, you will die instantly. The ash is going to cover you and rapidly going to replace the flesh of the bodies. But how it's possible to preserve, for, I mean, we say short time, but I mean one minute, two minutes, five minutes, it's time very long to preserve the posture of a person. So we discovered actually the only way to explain that each single posture was just perfectly preserved, it was also due to the cadaveric spasm, which is a kind of a sudden rigor mortis. And this is typical of people that died in battles, explosion, eruption, due to the exposure to, uh, the exposure to, to heat or strong emotional shock. So the sequence is that they died instantly. Cadaveric spams stopped the body, and then in a few minutes, half an hour, then the, the flesh of the bodies was replaced by the ash. And after 2,000 years, I went to excavate them, and they were perfectly preserved. So again, also in this case, also with the objects like these, or other objects found, personal objects found within the victims, uh, you can just see that there is no mechanical impact. So the people is not crushed within the, uh, the chambers on the wall or somewhere else. And even the smallest objects are just in place. So that means that there was no mechanical impact. All was very, very, very low. But they died due to, of course, the very high temperature. And here we have the evidence of how they died. So you see here very, uh, some examples of uh, exploded skull, like this, like this, like this. And you see that there is a lot of blackening outside, inside, again here. And uh, this was very interesting to me because uh, at the beginning of my work of, of restoration of the skeletons, in many cases, the skulls were moved. They put somewhere else. So they study and they put somewhere else. So I had the problem and said, okay, what was the real posture, the position of the skull in the, first, in, the real, in the real situation? And I found the answer in this. You see this one? This is the blackening, it's just the half part of the skull. So that means that this person was like this, and this part was black. So if you were sitting like this, this part should be black, and the rest not. Like this, black not, black not, black not. So I could, then I had the vertebral column, and so I could know how to replace the skulls. But uh, as regards the, 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 the effect of, of the heat and, and the causes of death, we know uh, through this kind of evidence, like this, here are just uh, iron residual, very probably from the degradation of the heme of hemoglobin. And uh, we know that actually in situations like this, when uh, the, the skull is going to, to, to boil, and uh, also you have a bleeding of the brain, 
the bleeding of the brain is one of the most important uh, causes of instant death. So we know that the people died due to the deletion of the brain and the bleeding of the blood. In some many cases, in most of cases, uh, after the disappearing of the flesh, the ash was still hot and fluid to replace the brain and to make a cast, ash cast of the brain. This is ash. This is a child, you see, just the searchers, very clean, the fontanelle, as we call it, here again. And this also was very interesting evidence. And here you see the, the reddish residual on the line of fractures, like these ones. And again, here are, there are several uh, other effects like contraction of uh, hands and feet. And again, and this is due to the nociceptor flexor reflex, which is due to the heat. You have uh, a sudden contraction of, of the muscles and tendons uh, as a response of the skin receptors to the heat. And during the excavation, I found, you see, on the bone, there's a maxilla on the teeth, on the bones of the fetus, uh, and below the level of ash, below the skeletons, was completely red, like this. Red here, red here, red in the... In the in the, um, the sand, and so through uh, mass spectrometry and uh, Raman microspectroscopy, we could provide evidence that such um, red residues were just the final products of a heme after degradation. So that was very interesting, and uh, it was actually a demonstration of uh, the, the rapid replacement of the flesh by the ash. Then later we made some experimentation. Also, we uh, made first, so before we, we, we saw uh, the, the macroscopic effects on the bodies and on the, the skeletons. And later we, we also tried, no, sorry, we tried to, to Okay, uh, we made some histological analysis from a victim from Pompeii, Herculanum, Oplontis. Oplontis is a villa, Villa B, which is just uh, uh, between Herculanum and Pompeii, but it's more close to Pompeii. And also some uh, uh, scanning electron microscope analysis. So at, at uh, histological level, the structure the microstructure of, of, the, of the bone doesn't change very much in Pompeii, almost nothing, just very few evidence of micro cracking, but very, very, very little. In Herculanum, the micro cracking, micro cracking is very strong, Oplond is even stronger. And uh, at ultrastructural level in Pompeii, there is nothing is going to change. In Herculanum, starts a little re uh, mineralization of the structure of the bone. And in Oplon, this is very strong. And uh, we know that this kind of uh, uh, process of remineralization uh, can occur uh, when uh, the body is exposed to a temperature of at least five, 600 degrees centigrade. Then we made an experimentation on recent human bone. These are just section of uh, and finger and uh, from we're supposed to temperature from 100 degrees centigrade until 800 degrees centigrade for uh, um, 15 seconds, uh, half minute, one minute, and so on. So uh, what we thought could be the time of exposure to the passage of the pyroclastic surge. And you see that uh, only around 300 degrees centigrade, the, the, the color of the bone is going to change. So you have a kind of reddish uh, color reddish, uh, black, 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 brownish, brownish, gray, gray, white, and so on. So through Chamo, mixing all together this kind of results, evidence, we could detect that actually the people, the victims, but the bodies, not the bodies, the skeletons of victims, were exposed to temperatures between 230, uh, uh, 250 and uh, 300 degrees centigrade in Pompeii, uh, 500 degrees centigrade in Herculanum and 600 degrees centigrade in Oplongus. 
This, of course, we'll see later, uh, uh, very important uh, data uh, for uh, volcanic risk evaluation. So altogether, uh, the sequence of events in, in, uh, during the 1790 eruption is the sudden death of people, eastern death of people, uh, rapid uh, replacement of the flesh by the ash, so vaporization of, of, of the bodies, of the flesh of the bodies, and uh, uh, the, the most important evidence was only what we said before, that here in Herculanum and partially in Oplontis you have just skeletons, while in Pompeii you can obtain casts. So uh, this is due to a difference of temperature between the two sites. Also here in Pompeii, you see, this is typical of uh, a cadaveric spasm, but also this is called pugilistic attitude. That's why in Pompeii they said at the beginning, archaeologists, okay, they died due to suffocation because they, you find no way like this, like uh, repairing, but it's not true. This is a, a post-mortem uh, posture. So due to uh, the, the, the shortening and the hydration of the muscle, you have an abduction to the body of the legs and of the arms. So it means, and it, this is called a uh, pugilistic attitude, but it's a post-mortem uh, uh, posture typical of fire victims. Now we go to the very recent discoveries. Uh, this is the, the College of the Augustales. This one is a part of it. And uh, during uh, the excavation in, uh, in 1961, a small room was found. And within this small room, there was a wooden bed and the skeleton of a victim inside the bed, just covered by the ash. You see that it's laying with face down. This is uh, a photograph I suppose from the 70s or the 80s. And, and here is the actual situation. Here, many bones I had to remove because they were moved. And now I'm restorating this part of the body and then to, to put it later back. Uh, and you see the body, you see the head, the trunk, then the, the pelvis, and uh, here is the left fin. All right, this, uh, uh, this body, differently from the ones uh, that they excavated on, on, the, on the beach, uh, this was completely exploded, carbonized and exploded, the skull and the body. Uh, and uh, it was October 2018, I was just cleaning a little bit the ash from the head, and I saw, I found this, a lot of fragments like this. And this, of course, could be only the brain, because it was inside the skull. It was not outside. I never saw before. No one, no one has saw before. This is the first time ever that uh, a vitrified material, uh, biological material, unseen material, was found. And this is, again, a fragment of brain. And then also we found some fragments of vitrified spinal cord. So, uh, we, we, we have uh, made some analysis by mass spectrometry and proteomics, and we found some fatty acids from human air fat, and also some proteins from uh, typical of um, uh, cerebral tissues. And we published this on the New England Journal of Medicine in uh, 23 uh, January uh, 2020. But later, during the um, lockdown, I was in Naples uh, by Skype, a uh, geologist was in uh, Rome by Skype, and the technician was near the, the microscope. And then he was just preparing the sample, and I uh, said, okay, try to start to make a photo. Okay, no, 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 stop, a little bit, move on the right now. And then, these are the, some of the thousand images that we had from this brain and from the spinal cord. So actually, it was the very first time it was possible to recognize, to find within a brain, old brain, 2000 old brain, but also older or more recent brain, and an ancient brain, to find a so very well preserved uh, central nervous system with uh, axons, uh, neuronal cells, axons, again, 
here is an axon and this is a neural cell. And this was really unbelievable. And this we published again on PLOS One in October. And, uh, and this is also, again, it's something very important because the vitrification of the, 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 the brain of this individual tell us that at the very beginning of the eruption, when the first surge was passing through the town, that had a time to kill everybody, but then we don't know why yet, not yet, there was a very rapid drop of temperature. And so you can have vitrification on, only if you have a rapid drop of temperature. And uh, uh, you know that uh, normally in clinical trials, you can obtain vitrification if you put uh, biological tissue in a liquid, liquid nitrogen at uh, 186 degree uh, centigrade below zero. So the important is to have a rapid drop. So it's the same if you have uh, uh, normal temperature and then you put uh, in a liquid nitrogen or you have 600 degrees centigrade and then it's going to drop rapidly to 400, 300. It's just the same. Now we are making an experimentation on these kind of uh, samples from the brain, uh, mostly just to try to uh, obtain the inverse process and to see how it was possible to obtain vitrification of this brain, but mostly to know uh, the, the, um, the transition time in which uh, the, the biological tissue became vitrified at the temperature at which this uh, happens. This is very important. And uh, I know which is a temper, but I can't tell you because still I have to, put, to publish this, so I will tell you after the next publication. But it's a, I can tell you that it's, a, it's unbelievable high temperature, higher than what we thought on the scale. This is again the situation within the both chambers. A couple of years ago, uh, we, we succeeded to have a grant from National Geographic uh, for this kind of project, genetic exploration of population of Arcunan, uh, D79. And uh, uh, this, is, this study is, is, is in course, and uh, we have some news about this, this uh, individual. So uh, we, we found several uh, first degree, second degree relationship between uh, the people, and uh, most of females are local genetically. And uh, while, for instance, many males are from several areas from the Mediterranean area, from very uh, different localities from the Mediterranean area. So we suppose, but after we will uh, have to make a comparison between genetical data, historical data, anthropological data, archaeological data to, uh, to reconstruct the story of, of the population in Arcana. Uh, probably the people uh, coming from outside, they were slaves, they came as slaves, and then they were uh, after they were freed, it, of course. In fact, we know that in Vietnam there, was a, there were a lot of uh, slaves that later, once became free, then, then uh, became rich and they bought houses from other people. Very, very important villas in Vietnam. In, in, in so it's a very complicated uh, uh, social and uh, anthropological and historical archaeological uh, story to be reconstructed. Now, before to, to end, uh, we talk just five minutes about the old Bronze Age eruption, so-called the Avellino Pumice eruption. Uh, here again, in... Uh, Qua c'è un'inversione. No, allora, this, this image must be here and this is here. Okay. Uh, San Paolo Belsito uh, in 1995, uh, 95 was called from the superintendents of, uh, of Naples and they told me, okay, we found two graves. I went there, they were, they were not graves, they were just two victims of this eruption, this prehistoric eruption, and they were just in the, in the pumice bed, laying in the pumice bed, you see, with the hands in the face. And uh, this was the first discovery of victims from a prehistoric eruption. 
And then later, 2002, in Nola, during uh, the, the, the realization of the fast railway line, uh, there was the discovery of a complete village, prehistoric village, there were four huts. So when, when, when in archaeology you talk about huts, it means that they found just the holes in the ground where holes were in. But in this case, you have just the prehistoric Pompeii. You see, this is the hut with the walls, uh, plates on the walls, objects inside, and outside the cage with nine pregnant goats and uh, the footprints uh, of animals. But later on, uh, in Afragola, 2005, we discovered, they discovered uh, during the excavation, the footprints of thousand, thousand footprints of people fleeing away during the eruption. All burnt and eruption, something unbelievable. And uh, all these uh, footprints were mostly going on northwest direction, Rome. So, of course, they had uh, Vesuvius back, so they went on the opposite direction. This is important because also testifies, of course, that if you escape in time, you can save yourself without seal protection and so on. Just escaping in time. Of course, after we demonstrated that there was a, a demographic collapse, because you can imagine that uh, most of the Campanian plain was completely covered from 30 meters of Vesuvius, one meter, 70 kilometers away from ash. So it's impossible to uh, make agriculture, it's impossible to build again, arts, it's impossible to leave. So many of these people just disappeared. And in fact, after the, the, the eruption, the first permanent uh, Middle Bronze Age sites are dated, uh, radiocarbon dated, uh, between 230 and 620 years. Or it means that it took at least two centuries before they could reoccupy the territory. It was uh, the most devastating uh, eruption all over uh, from Vesuvius. Much more devastating than the 1791. And this is the area. This is the fallout area. See, at the beginning of the eruption, before of the collapse of the Pinion Column, here is Vesuvius, here is actual uh, Naples. And these are all uh, the Middle Bronze Age sites. Now, these are the old Bronze Age sites covered by the eruption. And this is uh, the area covered by the pyroclastic uh, effects. And um, so we made several simulations, uh, computer simulations, and adopting all of the data that we, the real data that we had, uh, so depth of the deposits, so the, the victim distance from uh, of the structures from uh, found from uh, Vesuvius, and uh, we could say, okay, uh, if today should be an eruption like the Old Bronze Age one, at least half part of Naples. East Naples should be totally devastated. So the mechanical impact is enough to break buildings down. And uh, this was also, this is from National Geographic that uh, told this story uh, with the first, with the cover about the Zubio de Luxone Gabera and so on. So it was an interview to me and the uh, volcanologist about all the, the evidence that we found around the Zubis. These two met people going around for sites and uh, against the superintendents, you know. Oh, that sounds like another story. And so this is very important because uh, considering all the evidence, site evidence, laboratory evidence, and so on, we know that in a next eruption, at least within 10 kilometers from Vesuvius, you will have total devastation which is actually due to the mechanical impact. Between 10 and 15, you have big devastation and a lot of windy, big devastation and total mortality uh, between, uh, within 10 kilometers. Between 10 and 15, uh, large destruction, large, uh, large devastation and great mortality only after 15, 20 kilometers. If you escape in time, you can save yourself. So these are the, 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 the most important evidence that we can uh, uh, obtain from all what you, you, you saw here and uh, I've studied in, in these years. Uh, here are some uh, 
all the news from the world talked about uh, this kind of discoveries and uh, even this is the, the NASA told about this because okay now we know there are three million of people at risk in Naples not the only 700 as the civil protection uh, program says and this is very important because actually Naples doesn't have an evacuation plan. There is an evacuation plan only for the 700 people living just close to the cities, which is a nonsense, of course. Well, thank you very much.